British pop artists like the Specials are now attracting more attention all over the world than at any time during the last decade. But the giant record companies are in deep trouble. So who's behind the new boom? Where did you get that? No, Santa! Take him away! Good evening. During the 60s, London became the pop capital of the world. Until that time, the British pop scene had been dominated by American artists. Names like Bill Haley and the Comets, Buddy Holly, and of course, Elvis Presley. The advent of the Beatles changed all that, and for a while, British bands set the trends for America and for the rest of the world. In the early 70s, however, British pop music seemed to dry up, and the initiative swung back across the Atlantic. Tonight, we're going to examine how the British are managing to seize it back, and what price we're paying for that success. The Specials are currently one of the biggest names in British pop music. They're the leading band in a trend they themselves invented. It's called Two-Tone, and it's taken the kids by storm both here and abroad. Well, a lot of people said, well, you know, it's doing very well here, but, you know, it's not something that'll, that'll happen internationally. And, and the Specials in America, the tour was, you know, fantastic. The, you know, the, really the most, probably the most interesting new group to tour America for a long time. The reaction was, was just sensational. The specials don't owe their spectacular rise to fame to any of the giant recording companies. They started out here, in an upstairs room in this house in Coventry, making records on their own label. The specials records were marketed by this tiny outfit off London's Portobello Road, Rough Trade. Twenty years ago, this could never have happened. The specials would have had to get their break from one of the big London-based companies that between them had the British record market sewn up. Decca Records was one of the two biggest British companies. EMI was the other. Both have since fallen on hard times and been taken over. It's a sad contrast to the days when they dominated the pop scene. <laughs> When EMI signed up the Beatles in 1963, overnight they turned the record business into a money spinner no one had dreamed possible. The Beatles' colossal success paved the way to international stardom for a whole host of other British groups. <laughs> like The Animals made vast profits for the record companies. Chas Chandler was The Animals' bass guitarist. In spite of their profits, the companies paid people like him next to nothing. Uh, no, I mean, when you talk about the Beatles, I would say that they, you know, they got money because they made so much. Nothing, not all that could be hidden away from them, you know? But I mean, we used to sit in the, in the clubs at nights at the Adlib in, in London there. And we'd all sort of congregate up there, members of the different bands that, you know, were selling abroad. It was like Beatles, Stones, Animals, Hollies, and Mindbenders, Dave Clarks, and all that. And we'd all, all except Dave, Dave had, a good, <laughs> Dave had his head screwed on right from the beginning. And uh, he had a lease tape deal, and he owned the group, and he did well. But I think everybody else used to just sit there and go, look at our royalty, you know, two-fifths of one percent each, and one-fifth abroad. It was a joke. <laughs> am I, you know, made millions out of the Beatles. You know? Unbelievable amount of money. EMI has never let it be known exactly how much it did make from the Beatles, but it was lucky to have got the group at all. 
George Martin was a producer at EMI. It was he who in 1963 signed up the Beatles. But it was a quirky decision, for none of the other big companies had shown any interest in the band Brian Epstein had been touting around. I was told that everybody had turned them down. Um, I don't know how many people they'd seen. The most notorious ones were Decker, um, who had actually given them recording tests and uh, asked them to come back twice. I mean, they were very near it. And so, I mean, and that should be in their defence, more than anything else. Other labels had turned them down, including EMI, uh, apparently. Uh, Brian had already been to EMI and been turned down by two of the big four people there. How did you come to sign them yourself? Well, Brian was recommended to visit me because I had a reputation for offbeat recordings and um, I was the joker in the pack. And so he came to see me and that was it. Uh, in the early days of that success, how much money did the Beatles make from their records? I have no idea, but um, certainly not, you mean per record? Um, they made very little because I gave them a contract where they got one penny between the four of them, or the five of them in Brian's case, um, per single record, which wasn't very much. It was understandable that Sir Joseph Lockwood, the boss of EMI, and Sir Edward Lewis of Decca were not always successful in ensuring that their companies picked up new talent. They were more interested in hiring good businessmen rather than people with creative flair. Because their companies were so large and diversified, this was only natural. In the mid-60s, Chris Wright was a pop group manager. If you're a... a a holding company that owns a record company and you've got to pick someone to run that company, it's difficult to find people that can actually are, are creative and, and are, are good at the sort of the, the business aspects as well. And given the choice, I suppose the safer bet really is is for a company in that position to to uh, you know, give the give the the position to someone who is who is better sound business you know, business wise and perhaps uh, Sort of not not quite so strong on the creative uh, on the creative end. One of the groups Chris Wright managed was Jethro Tull. He tried in vain to get them signed up by one of the major companies. Jethro Tull were just beginning to make it, but we couldn't get anyone to to sign them at all. And uh, out of sheer frustration, uh, we put them into a, a small studio in London and made an album. And uh, you know, sort of that's how we started off Chrysalis Records. Chrysalis Records was only one of four important independent companies that emerged in the 60s and early 70s. Because these companies were small, the majors didn't see them as a threat. In fact, they were happy to collaborate with them. The independents couldn't really have got going without the majors agreeing to press their records for them in their huge pressing plants. The majors also distributed the independents' records to the shops. The arrangements seemed to suit everyone. The majors' big stars of the 60s went on selling well. With increasingly elaborate recording techniques to back them up, their music became more and more sophisticated. By the mid-70s, a new generation of teenagers was emerging. They were tired of tax exile 60s superstars old enough to be their fathers. Out of this frustration came punk rock. Rock gave this new generation a music of its own. Its essence was that it was rough, raucous and unsophisticated. It simply didn't matter if the recording was poor or the band couldn't play their instruments properly. New bands began to spring up everywhere. In November 1976, Susie Sue told Janet Street Porter how her band, Susie and the Banshees, was formed. Have you tried to get a band together? Yeah, I did a the Hundred Club for the Hulk Festival. Susie and the Banshees. What did you sing? The Lord's Prayer via Twist and Shout, Knocking on Heaven's Door, and a bit of Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber Alley. <laughs> <laughs> what went down the best? All of it. 
got boring in some parts, but it picked up. Are you a singer? Yeah. Had you sung before? Not on stage, no. Did you think that was important? Um, no. And who was backing you up? Sid Vicious on drums, Steve Spunker on bass, Marco on guitar, and me just doing the vocals. Stiff Little Fingers, now a successful band, came together at about the same time. It was just something to do on a Saturday afternoon. It was nothing to do in Belfast, where we lived, and nobody was playing the type of music we wanted to hear, so we thought, rather than hang about waiting for somebody else to do it, we'd play it. So we did, just for the fun of it. And when did you decide, as it were, to go into it seriously, and, uh, and when did you become Stiff Little Fingers? You realize? Yeah, well, I mean, we were Stiff Little Fingers when we started, I mean, but I mean, it wasn't wasn't that serious. It was literally just something to do on a Saturday afternoon. Henry and I just started messing about. We decided to try and get a band together. And uh, we failed, so we settled for these two instead. And uh, we, we just decided, you know, we got, we got fed up. We got fed up playing for ourselves. We decided to try and annoy some other people. So we played in the local pub just. And that's a big 10-4. Yeah, because uh, they didn't like us. <laughs> yes, no, they didn't like us, so we thought we must be on a winner. Mm. I mean, it used to be you had to be a brilliant guitar player to be in a group. You know, you had to be great at everything. But, I mean, it doesn't matter now. I mean, you still make good records and know three chords. Yeah. I mean, but you, I mean, you can put your own things into it and make good music out of it. One, two, three, four! This new sort of music posed severe problems for the major record companies. Not only EMI and Decca, but the big American companies too, who by now also had a quarter share of the British market. It was simply too alien from everything they were used to. I, mean, I had a problem with the new wave for punk bands in terms of trying to separate my experience, which told me you had to be... Uh, a professional in the musician sense that you could play your instrument particularly well that every lead guitarist I looked at had to play as well as you know fill in the blank whether it's Beck or Hendrix that I looked at a drummer on the basis of his uh, technical virtuosity that suddenly you came up with bands who seemed to be unschooled and what was your normal touchstone of decision-making did they play well could you hear the lyrics did you get a feeling that this was something that moved in the stream of another band. It was all new in the sense of suddenly being a revival of high energy music. Some majors, seeing the sales potential of punk rock, tried to overcome their natural aversion for it. In October 76, EMI signed up the Sex Pistols, but they soon found them just too hot to handle, and three months later, dropped them. The dislike between the majors and the new bands was mutual. The big companies seemed alien, untrustworthy, and remote. What do you feel about companies like that? Shit. <laughs> Thank you, Albert Thank Einstein. Thank you, Cam Ford. No, they're... No, they're, uh, they're just... And it's just like a big click, you know. They, they don't really. They've just got hundreds of bands and they can't handle no. them all, you know. It doesn't they can only handle the big are. artists, not really the rest of the bands that they have. Smaller bands. Well, I know I know nothing about them, but I would imagine that's what it'd be like, you know. You'd be just sort of small fish in a big ocean, you know. If CBS came to you, you'd be worried that you'd just get lost and you know you would, wouldn't get attention and you'd be forgotten because mm. you weren't one of the. Well, maybe. we know people have got into trouble with CBS just through the way CBS worked with people. You know. Stiff Little Fingers didn't go to Decca or another major when it came to getting their first records out. Instead, they went to the Rough Trade record shop, as many other like-minded bands were doing. The well, Rough Trade started in 76 as a shop, um, selling slightly specialist records, with them, and also the, the bands tended to sort of gravitate towards the shop. And <clears throat> the, the way we started making records was that we got so many but letters from people who wanted to buy records and couldn't get them at their own sort of local shop that we started a mail order and then in amongst the mail was were letters from bands who were trying to put out records and 
you know, so on and so forth. And we started to help them, you know, to manufacture records and put out records. The success in the charts of the new independent labels had a serious effect on the major companies. People who might previously have worked for them as talent spotters, or A&R men as they're known, decided instead to set up on their own. Chas Chandler is now an independent producer with his own studio. The lad that takes a job in an A&R department is really a, a bit of a second string, I'm afraid. Yeah. It's the very nature of the job. It doesn't take a great deal of investment to get a good act away. If you've got the record, it doesn't necessarily cost a fortune to, make the, to get that record popular. So therefore, the man that works in the A&R department, if he really has got a good ear and he really sees something, he'll end up signing it to himself leaving the company. On top of the difficulty of getting a share of the new music, all the major recording companies had other problems. Although their old superstars continued to sell, they were now asking huge amounts of money for new albums. All the other costs were going up too, particularly the costs of recording and the oil-based vinyl from which records are made. Meanwhile, because more people were taping other people's records rather than buying them themselves, the companies were losing £150 million a year. Album sales last year were down by 14%. All of these problems hit the majors much harder than the independents because they'd become extravagant, their overheads were high, and they were seriously overmanned. Throughout the major companies, there have been widespread layoffs. I mean, if you go buy a record, uh, business got a record company, and nowadays, you know, just watch out for flying bodies. <laughs> They're laying people off like left and centre, are they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's... Yeah. You can smell the fear walking the corridors. EMI and Decca, however, had further special problems which couldn't be cured simply by layoffs. Apart from producing records, EMI was also heavily involved in electronics and had sunk a lot of money into developing a revolutionary brain scanner. The project had run into acute difficulties and put the company's finances under severe pressure. Between 1977 and 79, EMI's profits had fallen from £65 million to £11 million. And in December last year, the company was taken over by the giant Thorne Electrical Group. Decker had a more mundane but yet more devastating problem. The man who'd built the company up from nothing, Sir Edward Lewis, simply grew senile and refused to give up control. The company declined. Sir Edward died in January of this year, shortly after a takeover of Decker's record division had been agreed with the German-Dutch record firm Polygram. Increasingly, the major companies have had to become pressing and distribution agents for the smaller London-based independents. These smaller companies, of which there are now several hundred, have revolutionised the recording industry, and it's they who are behind the new worldwide success of British music. In part two, we'll be examining how they've pulled it off and what's been the cost of success. Please. Very excellent Delta 5. Delta 5 from Leeds have been playing together for just over a year. Tonight they're making their debut at the Rock Garden in Covent Garden. This is colour. Delta 5's first single came out last year on Rough Trade. It didn't make the charts, but it did sell 13,500 copies. We asked them how they came to make it. Well, we'd made a demo tape, and Rough Trade heard it and liked it, and made us an offer for it, really. A one-off single. Yeah, that's what we, we wanted. 
a one-off single because we wanted to pace ourselves time-wise. So we didn't want any sort of larger commitment than that. And Rough Trade were willing to do it. And uh, how did you first get in touch with them? Did you come to them or did they come to you? No, we went to them. Yeah. <laughs> we had the tape, you know, already done. And, uh, when we took it along, we had it re well, we remixed it before they put it out. Yeah. And, they, and they were enthusiastic about it. Very enthusiastic. And Jeff, Jeff came Actually, it was the first place we'd actually... And showed enthusiasm and he, he thought it was great. We didn't take it anywhere else. It was the first place we went, which was mm. really lucky, but, you know. He also wanted the first single out on an independent label. Why? So we didn't have to sign anything. <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I it was a one-off, so we didn't have to sign anything until we weren't committed to anything. Yeah, that's mm. why. And the independents are far more likely to do that anyway, but I personally wanted it out on an independent label rather than a big label. And Ros agreed that. Delta 5 are only one of hundreds of new bands getting their break through new independent record companies like Rough Trade. But as long as they stay with Rough Trade, Delta 5 are extremely unlikely to become famous. Strange as it may seem, and in sharp contrast to traditional record companies, Rough Trade simply aren't interested in turning their bands into stars. Their whole aim is to allow as many new bands as possible to survive without needing stardom. One of the major problems with the music industry at the moment is the kind of thinking that the only place for a band in, in the industry is either fed as superstars or as, or as absolutely nothing at all. And it was our contention that we'd like to explore the possibility of being able to generate a sort of basic life support system for people who wanted to make, to make, to make music. We're not fans of the idea of a, of a professional, professional musician in the same ways that I'm not a professional sort of record company man. I'm just a person doing what I enjoy doing. And so that is the thinking behind it. Because of this philosophy, Rough Trade and others like them never attempt to tie their bands up in long-term contracts. Well, basically, it's just a 50-50 profit-sharing deal. All our deals are one-offs, in other words. We don't have anybody signed on a long-term contract, and we, we actually share the overall profit on the record. Well, we'll give us some um, box of each of those. The existence of new companies like Rough Trade means that more young bands than ever before are getting to make a record. It's a far cry from when Brian Epstein had to tout the Beatles from door to door to get them a start. Rough Trade's anti-star philosophy and their determination to avoid long-term contracts make it natural that their more successful and ambitious bands will get poached. But it's not the majors who are doing most of this poaching. 30th, 1st of May, 7th. Dave Robinson is the boss of Stiff Records. It's a small independent company. But unlike Rough Trade, its whole aim is to create stars. Stiff's survival depends entirely on spotting new sorts of bands and promoting them fiercely, both here and abroad. Among stiff stars are Ian Dury and Lena Lovich. Yeah, I think we should put as many as possible in the cars, because I think... Next One of Dave Robinson's week, talent spotters, Paul Conroy, really was sent along on the night Delta 5 was playing at the Rock Garden to see what the band was like. Mm. Mm. <laughs> We're trying to get acts which are going to be long-term and break in America. We're looking for those acts which are going to last and not just just do one single and uh, disappear off the face of the earth. And that's what we're best at, marketing, promotion. And once we've seen that fresh talent out there, we like to take it and say, look, what we suggest is this, that, the other, and we'll take the full-page ads in all the music papers and the comics generally, and we'll promote you, get you on all the best tours, and uh, hopefully get, you know, get the press into the band and the whole bit. Although he liked the band, 
Paul Conroy decided Delta V were not commercial enough to be signed on by Stick. The Specials are probably the most successful of the new bands to be poached from Rough Trade. They were poached by Chrysalis Records. So were Stiff Little Fingers. They told us why they decided to leave Rough Trade. Well, I remember having to fight with them for about three weeks to get a quarter page ad to advertise a nationwide tour, which is just ludicrous, you know. Um, it was basically because we just had different viewpoints on what we wanted to do. And like I said, I wanted to build a career and Rough Trade wanted to make records, which may sound like the same thing to most people, but it's not really, especially when you reach the stage where you have to fight with them about things like that. At Chrysalis, I've had to fight about ads, but that's only to get them to make them smaller rather than bigger, you know, because I'm worried they'll go over the top from the promotion. You know. An entirely new system then has evolved. Companies like Stiff and Chrysalis poach and promote the best of the multitude of new bands discovered by the smaller independents. This system is the key to the current success of British music. But the very thing that makes it successful has also brought problems. The need to find new trends has produced a sort of inbuilt obsolescence. Mickey Most, an independent producer, has been in the record business for nearly 20 years. It's, it's, it's so disposable, it's like a fortnightly business. Every two weeks there's a new, new change, and unless you're moving with it, um, you can have problems. I don't know whether to try and keep it in, in that groove or just sort of wait until they sort of disappear and uh, you know take a sort of two or three months off and because by the end of the summer you'll find that what's going on now will almost be as old-fashioned as Bing Crosby. At the moment two-tone is highly fashionable and two-tone bands like the specials have enjoyed a meteoric rise to fame but more than ever before such bands now risk an equally rapid plunge into oblivion. Jerry Dammers, the Specials keyboard player, and the man who created the whole two-tone style, is known to be worried about this. He's concerned that Chrysalis is promoting the Specials too heavily, and that this may mean an abrupt collapse of the whole two-tone trend. It's not only the bands whose survival is precarious in the new turbulent music scene. The very people who are making the market so hectic are themselves at risk. Dave Robinson, boss of Stiff, is well aware of what could happen to his firm if he misjudges the next trend. Well, it'll go down to Swanee, you know. I mean, we started with very little money, and we've always done a little better than that ever since. So we've got not a lot to lose, really. For some well, years you put into it, but that's, uh, I've had a lot of fun out of it. I think you've had a lot to lose, but it's quite easy to lose it. I don't mind, really. I don't, you know. I mean, honestly, I don't really care. Day to day, I mean, I'll go down with a, with a lot of kind of screaming and shouting, but uh, I don't really care about it. So for the men behind the new success of British music, it's a dangerous life. But even if they do misjudge the next trend and go down the swanee, there are plenty more enthusiasts eager to try their luck in the music business. The independents are likely to go on seizing the musical initiative. The irony of it all is that they could never have blossomed in the way they have without the majors' collaboration. If the majors had at the start refused to press the smaller labels' records, they could probably have maintained their monopoly of the record business practically intact. Now, however, they've left it too late. The independent sector is well enough established, if need be, to organise its own pressing and distribution without the majors' collaboration. So it looks as though the music scene is likely to go on getting more exciting and more dangerous for a long time to come. That's all for this week. So from all of us on the London programme, good night. <laughs>